Welcome to Transformations, interviewing people changing our world. I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, and as you've noticed by now, every person that I interview is someone who had something touch them so deeply, they knew they had to do something about it. And when they did that, they changed the world for the better for all of us. And today I have somebody who's done just that and is going to bring to our attention something we don't pay attention to very much. And her name is Dr. Donna Beagle and her company is Communications Across Barriers and it focuses on poverty. So welcome, Donna. It's lovely to have you here. It's good to be with you, Diane. So if you would be kind enough to um, tell us why you founded Communications Across Barriers, what your background is, and what you're doing with Communications Across Barriers. So it's kind of an interesting story. I grew up in generations of migrant labor poverty, and I have five brothers. I'm the only person who's not been incarcerated. And I had this professor who was at the University of Portland, and I would tell him stories about my brother, but I never told him he was in prison because I wanted him to like him, not judge him. So after uh, telling him a few stories, he said, so where does your brother live? And I said, um, he lives in Pendleton. And then the prison moved him to Salem. And I'm like, he, he lives in Salem. A few weeks later, oh, but he's in. And finally, after the prison third time moved him, he said, where is he? I thought you said he lived in Salem. And I told him he, he's in prison. And he said, oh, well, can I go see him? And I was like, you would go see my brother? And he did, and we went to the prison, and Dr. Bob Fulford became a significant mentor to me, was um, pretty uh, well known in our uh, media. He taught media rhetoric and society, and so anytime there was a political campaign, they went to interview Dr. Bob Fulford. So going to the prison was a big deal, and we got there, the warden was there, and had a conversation with uh, Dr. Fulford, and as we were leaving, Dr. Fulford said to me, they need some help in here. He said they're having a real problem with people being able to get along because of poverty, race, and gender issues. And he said, I, I told him you and I could help him. He said, how would you like to start a company? And this was 1989. And I was at this point barely learning how to say a complete sentence because I said ain't every other word and I didn't know when to say gone or went or how people knew when to say seen or saw. I certainly didn't know what a business was, but I trusted him and I said, okay. And he said, okay, well, um, usually in businesses, people play different roles. So what role would you like to play? And I was like, president? <laughs> and he said, okay. So a few weeks later he comes, he's got a business license. Communication Across Barriers was the name of a course he was teaching at University of Portland. And I was in that course. It was focused on communicating and relating more effectively across poverty, race, class, uh, poverty, race, gender, and generational differences. And he had business cards made, and I was listed as president, and he was listed as vice president. And we had our first contract with the prison to develop a 10-week course for people who are in prison to be able to better get along while they're in and when they get up into their communities. So that was the birth of Communication Across Barriers in 1989. Um, it's been 30 years now I've been doing this work. Um, all 50 states I've worked, eight countries, all word of mouth. I work with all sectors. Uh, I was Speaker of the Year for the New Mexico Bar Foundation. I have a partnership with the American Bar Foundation. They send my book, um, Breaking Poverty Barriers to Equal Justice to all pro bono attorneys in the United States. And that's really to get at the idea that we have a justice system that works pretty well for people who have and very different justice system for people who don't. Um, I partnered with the National St. Vincent de Paul Society. They send my book, uh, If Not Me, Then Who? Empowering Our Neighbors to all of their con Congress uh, conferences around the country to train all of their volunteers to be poverty informed, to have poverty competencies. And one of the things that you will know after talking to me five minutes is I tell people I know too much to be quiet. Mm -hmm. um, I know we are losing so many people in the war zone of poverty. And, and I grew up 
watching people my whole life work hard and still get evicted, work hard and still go hungry. Uh, it didn't matter if we worked. And the kinds of jobs you're going to get when you're not literate, which most of my family members are not literate. Uh, I actually had a person say to me, there are no more illiterate people in America. And I was like, wow, you should come to my place for a karaoke party. You could meet a few. <laughs> you know, We have millions of people who struggle with literacy, who struggle. Maybe they're like some of my family members are functionally literate. But if you put a newspaper in front of them, they couldn't read it. So I dropped out of school at 15. I got married. I had my honeymoon in a cherry field in Washington State. Married a guy from deep generational migrant labor poverty who had dropped out of seventh grade. So I had six months of the ninth grade. He had seventh grade. And we began our lives exactly like we had grown up and working that day for food that night. Just every day was just like reacting to the bullets of poverty. And how are we going to put out, how are we going to make it through? Why do you think our country is like that? And one of the things that the pandemic is doing is highlighting things like this, that the people who are keeping it together for us, keeping, keeping us fed, are all people who would be in poverty. Yes. So what's with this country? What, how do we look at that? And um, let me, as a sidebar, I watched your PBS um, interview face to face, which is very powerful. Everyone should watch it. Um, and it was very uncomfortable to watch because we do not look at poverty here. So I would love to hear how we got here and what we need to change in our consciousness. Well, there is a documentary coming out on my family and it's called Invisible Nation. And it's called Invisible Nation for a very good reason. I, I grew up believing that people didn't care. Uh, uh, the people who are making it don't care about the people who aren't. And I, I learned those things from lived experiences like watching my mom and dad go ask for help and there would be plastic or glass between them and the people. Uh, and the tone of voice they were talked to would make your skin crawl. Uh, we got strong messages uh, from the moment we open our eyes that we're not wanted, we're a bother, we're a problem. And in the literature, if you look at the literature on generational poverty, people from generations of destitution are labeled the dangerous class, the underclass, the hard to serve. Uh, many organizations won't even serve people who live in deep poverty uh, because uh, they don't have a clear understanding of how poverty impacts you when it's layered upon generations and generations. So I, I did grow up believing that people didn't care. When I was 28, I got to the university. I got my GED at 26. When I was 28, I got to the University of Portland and that was my first time ever being around people who were making it. And one of the concepts I teach is that the isolation of poverty perpetuates it. It allows us to remain ignorant. It allows us to create policies that often punish and spiral deeper into poverty. Uh, so, so I didn't know people who were making it. I never had meaningful conversations. I tell people at 15, I never knew a soul who benefited from education. The, the kinds of schools that we went to were the schools that middle-class folks would never send their kids. And that's another thing I teach is that we have an education system where you can go to almost any community in the United States and ask, where are your good schools? You know, just that question we should be appalled by because that tells us something. That tells us not all our children get the same chance. And yet what I learned is we graduate people from college. We don't teach it in high school or college. Uh, the history of poverty, United States of America. Uh, most people don't even have a clear definition of that word. Because you can talk to uh, 10 people and get 10 different ideas about what poverty is. When I did my doctoral research, I wanted to interview people from generations of poverty who were able to get bachelor's degrees. Because I could not find their voices in the literature. I found uh, the terminology of generational poverty, but I would start reading it and it would be about race issues. 
or I start reading and it would be about working class issues, or I start reading and it was situational poverty or any of the many different types of poverty. And in my book, See Poverty Be the Difference, I go into many different types of poverty because that's one of the problems in addressing it is we don't have a clear definition. So I put out a call for candidates for my doctoral research and I wanted, you have to have a bachelor's degree and you have to come from deep poverty. So this guy said, I'll do your study for you. I grew up poor. I said, thank you so much. So how did your family get by? And he said, well, my father was a physician. He died. I was 12 years old and I had to go live with grandparents. I worked in their store. I had the right mindset and I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps and I became a doctor like my dad. And I'm processing that through the lived experience of fighting my five brothers for the back window of the car. Uh, and I'm thinking, you knew someone who owned a store and you were related to them? That's not poverty. But if you look at it from his context, who do the children of professionals spend time with? It's typically other children of professionals. Well, we compare ourselves to the people around us. So his peers are not going to live with grandparents. His peers are not working in a store. So in his eyes, he grew up poor. So how might he treat somebody who comes from generational poverty or working class poverty or immigrant poverty? Probably like this. Hey, I did it. Why can't you? Um, because if there isn't a, a, a deep understanding of the different levels of poverty, and those access points, the differences in access to resources and opportunities, it's easy to project your experience onto others. Uh, and it doesn't invalidate that losing your father at 12 is not painful. It is. Um, but it's different than somebody who's lived in a car their whole life. You're probably not saying ain't every other word. You probably have your teeth. And you've probably been exposed to uh, the importance the, the avenues that middle-class people get exposed to. Uh, middle-class folks are taught, if you want to make it, you get educated, you get skilled. People in poverty are taught, if you want to make it, you work hard. Well, we work hard and we still get evicted. So it's just matter. knowing what's possible. I mean, I, it sounds to me like from the background that you're talking about, from poverty, that the ideas that you can actually have something, do something, don't even exist. No, I, you know, well, you, poverty steals your hope and it steals your confidence. So you come to believe that something's wrong with you. Paulo Freire is a Brazilian scholar who writes about poverty worldwide. And he says, the United States is the only country in the entire world that teaches its people they are the cause of poverty because we don't educate about it. We literally graduate people to be psychiatrists, social workers, judges, lawyers, elected officials, business leaders faith-based leaders, and they've never had the history of poverty in this country. They, 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 again, they don't have a clear definition, even of like what models have we used to address it and what's worked and what's been effective. There's not a shared conversation happening. Um, since uh, Johnson declared war on poverty, there hasn't been a national focus saying, Poverty's not okay in this wealthy country. We're not gonna have it. Um, so let's build in the infrastructure. And most people, because they haven't studied the history of poverty, they don't know that the war on poverty was working. It was working, Johnson did it right. He said things like, you know, we need people in the communities who can really understand what people are going through uh, or boots on the ground, he called it. So community action agencies were born. Uh, he said, we need all children to have preschool, not just the ones who have money. Head Start was born. Uh, the TRIO program to help people get a skill or an education was born. So many programs came out under Johnson's War on Poverty. We reduced poverty by 23% at that time. Uh, what happened was they pulled all the funding and resources and people out of the war on poverty and they put it into the war in Vietnam. So all of a sudden these fragmented efforts began happening and the organizations that were solid models began struggling like people in poverty to keep their own doors open. And that's still true today. So many of these programs still exist today, but they are so underfunded and the people within them are so overworked that they struggle to meet the complexities that people in their communities are facing. But nobody knows about poverty. I mean, I, there's a difference between being broke 
and being poor. Yes. And, and I mean, that's, that's where the middle class falls down. I mean, I know what it is to be broke. I don't know what it is to be poor. I have an advanced degree and I know I can always start a business, not because I have money, but because I know how to do it. And right. so those are resources that are ground into me. And, and what I'm understanding is that there are people who just don't even understand that. And we as a, if, and you have a book on class, I'm going to go through your books again, but as middle class, we don't even acknowledge or know that there are poor. I mean, in the sense that you're talking about poor, not in the sense that I was talking about it. Right. Well, you know, I have an activity. We do these two-day poverty immersion institutes and people say they're just life-changing. And one of the activities I do in there is know thyself. Because fighting poverty begins with understanding your own attitudes and beliefs and really thinking through where did you get your ideas about poverty and the people who live in it? What do you believe causes poverty? If you haven't done that work, then your, your tone of voice won't change. Your ability as a leader to develop policies that meet people where they are, not where we want them to be, but actually where they are. A an example of that is when I was on welfare uh, in 1986, my daughter, Jennifer was six, my son, Daniel was two. My 15 year old cousin was homeless. She lived with me and I got $408 a month and my rent was $395. So after paying for my rent in a neighborhood called Felony Flats, I had $13 left. Uh, my welfare worker said to me, if, if I could be more responsible and save money, that they were able to match whatever I saved and that would help me to get out of poverty. And this was a well-meaning, well-intentioned social worker. But inhumane to say to somebody who has $13, save some money, be more responsible. So that's that blaming the people that Paulo Ferrer was talking about. In third world countries, developing nations, you don't hear people saying, you know, if you would just work harder in this third world country, you wouldn't be poor. Yeah. You would just, if you just make some better choices, they are ab absolutely honest about, hey, we have a broken infrastructure. <laughs> hey, you know what? We don't have access to capital. So, so the conversation, so you can go, and I've worked in, in developing countries with destitution, people who have nothing, but what they have that people here do not is their sense of self yeah. and that, that hope that has not been stolen. Uh, in America, people lose hope, and hope is the wings for grabbing an opportunity. Without that, I mean, if you read my bio, it doesn't start out with GED at 26. It starts out with confidence. And, and, and before that, I couldn't even think about getting a GED. Why would I try to get a GED? I'm not smart. I don't know the words people use. All through school, my teachers would talk about things that I didn't know. What are they talking about? And I would say to my teachers, what is that word? And my teachers would say, well, go look it up in the dictionary. You need to be a responsible, independent learner. I go to the dictionary. There's five more words I don't know. Yeah. And nobody, nobody in my environment uh, who could tell me what does this word mean? Or even teachers would explain subject matter using middle-class experiences. Because where do we get our examples? They're from our own backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So when you teach or explain something, you're pulling examples from your, well, everybody knows this. Well, everybody's done that. Everybody's been, not, you know, we haven't. I remember being. Also, it's, it's like race in this country. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, that's very and true. And there has to be something that wakes you up. You're a wake up call for me. Consciousness. And you're, yeah, absolutely. But we're a very unconscious culture. Yeah, we're, we are, we are, I mean, when I learned, when I got to University of Portland, I'm finally around people who are making it and I'm seeing them do really caring behaviors. Mm -hmm. They're donating time and money and food and energy. And I'm thinking that is incongruent with my 28 years of believing people don't care. Yeah. So I started talking to people about poverty and I learned two things real quick. One, they really did care. And that was huge huge for me. Mother Teresa says to believe your fellow human beings don't care is more painful than hunger. And I, I completely agree with her. Um, but at the same time I learned that they cared, I learned that they didn't have a clue. They could no more describe my life in the context of generational poverty than I could talk about middle-class 
person's life of like things like, oh, let's wait for everyone to get a plate to eat. You know, I have five brothers. I live in the deepest poverty in this country. What, we, what would happen in my context if I waited for everyone to get a plate? <laughs> so many times we ask people in crisis to do behavior that makes no sense in their context. Yeah. I remember I worked for the Y at one point. We did teenage programs. So we're going into schools. And these girls are getting pregnant and getting beaten up and everything. And what were we supposed to do? Teach them how to set a table. That's the kind of unconsciousness. So what do we do about that? I mean, we can go to your institute, but you need to know something in order to go there. So as a culture, what the hell can we do? <laughs> well, I will tell you, the hope is that when people do know, yeah. they can't go back. And you know, when I even just sharing the story of when I was on welfare and the, uh, had $13 left and I got an eviction notice and I went to the welfare worker and I said, can you help me? I have an eviction notice. And she said, well, if you have an eviction notice, you're now mandated to do money management classes. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. But... Yeah. Even beginning to understand the, the injuries that are inflicted on people who are in the crisis of poverty. So the organization, I work with, again, I work with all sectors. I work with faith-based, I work with K-12, I work with higher ed. And let me give you an example of, of how change happens. So Amarillo College uh, brought me in, uh, brought my institutes in and Actually, first I went there and I trained 350 community leaders uh, with poverty competencies, gave them a shared language to actually have honest conversations about what is in the way of people in generational poverty, working class poverty, immigrant poverty, situational poverty, mixed class poverty, any of the many different lived experience. What's in the way? How do policies look from the points of view of people in these different contexts? How do they play out? And so getting those leaders informed so that they begin doing poverty competency analysis of their own organizations, really looking at professional development levels, mm -hmm. uh, what if, building it into the infrastructure of the system, your hiring process. What do you believe about poverty and the people who live in it? That answer will tell you where someone is on a continuum of poverty competencies. And it doesn't mean you don't hire them because you got to expect ignorance in a society where we graduate people from college without a foundational understanding of this thing called poverty. But you build in the training necessary so that that person isn't doing unintentional harm. In the psychological research, uh, researchers say that our subconscious mind responds before our conscious mind. So, so many people are, are so programmed that, well, they get rich off welfare. They're having babies to get welfare. Well, they have Nikes, but they can't afford their food. It's not understanding any of the whys behind that behavior and not even realizing that they're judging, uh, that they're judging. And it's coming through in their tone of voice, their facial expressions. It's coming through in the kinds of de decisions we make. So with Amarillo College, after I trained the leaders, they sent 11 members of the college uh, faculty and staff, including the president, to become Beagle certified poverty coaches. This means they attend the two-day poverty institute. They do book reads with See Poverty Be the Difference. They go to the Beagle Coaching Two-Day Institute. And in this institute, they're really gonna learn how to do a poverty competency assessment how to look at the strength of our partnerships in our organization. They're going to look at uh, curriculum or programs uh, through the eyes of people who live in the crisis of poverty. They're going to examine those policies. In my doctoral research, I studied policy. And policies are meant to serve. Policies that punish are called bad policy. And so many of our policies punish and spiral people in our court system, in our health system, in our justice system, I mean, every system you can think of. So many of our policies are not, they're perpetuating the poverty rather than setting people up for success. So Amarillo College had 11 Beagle certified poverty coaches. Very first year, they doubled retention of students on Pell Grants. Mm -hmm. By making, by now they're poverty informed. Now they're looking at their system through the eyes of the students who live in the crisis of poverty and saying, is this working? Is our financial aid process working? Is our advising process working? They now spend, 
almost 10 years, they now have 82 Beagle Certified Poverty Coaches at Amarillo College. They've won the Aspen Award, the Bellwether Award twice. They're written up in just about any magazine you can read or new or journal where they are breaking records. Because if a student from poverty actually makes it to college, which is rare, the deeper the poverty, less likely they will be on a campus. Uh, so if they make it to college, only 11% leave with a degree or certificate. If they're from foster care, that drops to 3%. So our colleges are not set up uh, to be ready for the students. So our K-12 systems, it's not about how, how we get the students to be ready for us. It's not about making, fixing the student or fixing the family. We got to fix our sectors of our society that are not meeting people where they are. So uh, when I do community-wide work, we have an opportunity community model in multiple cities around the country, what we do is we gather all sectors together, all leaders, banks, chamber of commerce, the United Way, the, the community action, all of the leaders, business leaders, and you get them some fundamental understanding of this thing called poverty. And you then, they have the language to, to, to have a dialogue they work together in ways they haven't worked before because it becomes not about turf or you might get my funding, but about the, the person or the family that we're working to really walk with them on a journey to move out and stay out of poverty. So it, it really does take a paradigm shift, a much deeper understanding of poverty. Uh, we have to get to the point where we, we take a NASA attitude. Failure is simply not an option. I mean, we send people to space and we say, no mistakes, no mistakes. We can't let any failure happen. Why would we allow it in our own communities? Uh, and, and again, really thinking through the ways we work together in our communities. You can't have a single focused approach and address the complexities of poverty. What you end up with is things like, here's a three-day box of emergency food. Good luck. Yeah. Never mind, you have untreated mental health issues. You have... No, uh, no literacy or you have learning challenges or you're depressed or or you have uh, no food to eat. I mean, you maybe have no place to sleep tonight. So, so it's about a comprehensive poverty informed approach versus a single fragmented band-aid approach. Uh, when I talk to people in poverty all over America and I talk to kids and adults, the thing I keep hearing over and over again is, yeah, they helped me get my lights turned on, but we never had opportunity. So uh, many communities tend to focus on putting the fires out without building in the infrastructure of stable housing, affordable housing, living wage jobs, access to nutrition for strong, healthy brains and bodies, uh, the preventative care. Uh, people in poverty die on average 15 years younger than people born in a middle-class context. And in ignorance, we say, well, they drink too much, they smoke too much, and they don't take care of themselves. Well, the federal government did a study of early deaths by social class, and they found that only 13% of those deaths could be attributed to drinking, smoking, not taking care of yourself. 87% of the deaths were attributed to living in polluted neighborhoods, working in unsafe jobs, the stress of poverty itself, which affects immunity and kills short-term brain cells, the, the at, lack of access to preventative care. And you're seeing that with COVID-19. I mean, who's dying? It is primarily people who have pre-existing conditions from the impacts of poverty. African-American, twice as likely to die sure. because the, the a combination of poverty and race will affect their ability to get that preventative care, to have that nutrition, to have you know, Maslow taught us what humans need to, to develop to their potential. We know what to do. And, and it's cheaper to do that and actually invest in children and families and adults in our community than it is to pay for the symptoms of poverty. If you look at, at programs like Housing First, where they will give you a place to live, no questions asked, no hurdles to jump through. You need a place, you're a human, you got to have a pillow place to lay your head they're having phenomenal success and saving millions of dollars in taxpayer money. Because if you look at what does it cost a taxpayer for one person to be on the streets? Um, in Utah, it's $20,000 a year taxpayers spend for you to be homeless. In Los Angeles, it's $36,000 a year 
for you to be homeless. It doesn't even make sense. It makes zero sense. And, and how think can, like, how can yeah. we use the awareness that's coming from the pandemic? I mean, people are starting to wave to people who are working in hospitals, understanding okay. that the migrant workers who are picking our food are keeping us supplied. Um, truck drivers, all that. How can we capitalize on that awareness before it slips away? I've been doing a, a, a mini poverty and COVID-19 series and, and people can access that on my website. There's six mini sessions on there now um, just as a way of giving back and trying to help with this whole, how do you create a post-pandemic plan to deal with the poverty you already have and the increased poverty, 36 million people applying for unemployment. So are we ready for that? Are we ready as a community? And, and one thing I want to be very clear about I, I think when people think scarcity, when, when human beings think there's not enough, it is our natural instinct to do what? Yeah, to hoard. But it's, yeah. it's not true. There's it is not true. It is not true. So we have to begin to shift our paradigms away from that scarcity mentality and realize we are the land of excess. We are the land of privilege. And we are a wealthy, wealthy country spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on the symptoms of poverty. So what if we realign in our communities? And some of this is happening. You're right, during COVID, you see people aren't getting evicted. Um, people aren't, I mean, you have uh, states where you're not allowed to turn people's lights off. You're not allowed to take their water away. Um, you have states that, where people are uh, leasing motels to get people off the streets. Now that is a short-term solution, and I'm, and I'm going to teach always capacity and long-term solutions because giving me a motel for two months isn't going to get me out of the crisis of poverty. Uh, and again, the deeper the poverty, the more investments we have to make in the wraparound services that people will need because the injuries are deeper. Uh, so, so COVID-19 is shedding a light on both poverty and racism. And we're seeing, we're seeing it so clearly, but you, you, when you aren't poverty informed, you actually have a, a consciousness where people ask questions like, Dr. Beagle, don't you think that middle-class people are just better looking? <gasps> it, that's horrific. Yeah. And my response is, well, maybe, but they pay to be so. It's yeah. expensive to look good. <laughs> you know, you got, if you've never been to a dentist, I mean, my brother Wayne, his whole mouth's full of super glue because he accidentally, he was opening a tube of super glue and it dripped in his mouth and he discovered, oh, it killed my pain. So from that point on, he put super glue in his mouth every time he has a toothache. You know, when people see somebody with rotten teeth or no teeth, well, and I've asked this question for 30 years, what's the first thing you think? Meth. They're drug addicts. Why does your brain go to blame and judgment? Why aren't we saying, wonder if they've ever had nutrition to build strong, healthy teeth? Wonder if they've ever seen a dentist? I mean, you have 40 million people living in the crisis of poverty before COVID-19 at, at, at without preventative care. It's triple that for dental care, access to dental care. So what we should be saying is, what, where's the access and capacity for people rather than the blame and judgment. Portland State University has a new School of Social Work building in their classrooms that were named in my honor, which is very, very weird. I went to the ribbon cutting for the building and this professor said, oh, you're Dr. Donna Beagle. I, I've been teaching in the Donna Beagle community classrooms and I thought you were dead. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is very strange. But the cool thing is uh, the School of Social Work has been in the basement at Portland State for decades with peeling paint. And I really believe in our communities where we place things shows what we value. And the donor said, this is going to be the penthouse for people who are going to have their feet working on the ground. So if you come to Portland, Oregon, you'll see it overlooks the city. There's a terrace. It's beautiful. And they let my cousin, who had no K-12 education, but she is my graphic designer. So any of my, my books, any graphics you see on my website, that's my cousin Wanda, who her mom and my mom are sisters, and her mom makes an X for her name. Um, but Wanda did the interior, so when you walk in, it says, believe people can make it out of poverty. 
If you don't, they probably won't. That's a quote from See Poverty, Be the Difference. It says, if you are judging, you cannot connect. If you cannot connect, you cannot communicate. If you cannot communicate, how on earth will we eradicate poverty or educate? We, we just can't. So how do you suspend judgment? You got to get more information. You got to get poverty informed. And, and that is essential. So we do trainings with organizations, uh, all different levels. We do uh, the, our poverty immersion institutes. Uh, people do book reads with See Poverty. Two of my books have training videos with them. So people can go through, like watch 10 or 12 minutes and then go into a workbook or they can read along with that book. Um, but those are some of the ways to gain poverty competencies. Listening to the people who are in it. Uh, the more you listen, the more you understand. Uh, there's a tendency to want to come in and just project and say, oh, if you would only just do that. Well, that kind of works out like this. I'm 26 years old. I'm uh, homeless with Jennifer, six years old, Daniel's two, Linda's 15, my cousin. And I go to this, well, actually before I became homeless, I, I went to this community action to ask for help with getting my lights turned on. And the woman there said, well, I think we have some vouchers and we can help you. Um, and you might want to check out this program. And this is unique to community action agencies. They were built to do the both and approach. Yes, you need your lights turned on and here's an opportunity. So she said, yes, we can help you get your lights on. And hey, why don't you check out this new program? It's a, it's a new pilot program. It's going to start up for single moms and it might be helpful. And at that time in my life, I was 26. I had attitude uh, and I had smart mouth. So once I got my voucher for getting my lights on, I said, why don't you go do the program? Now, when I work with people in, in our opportunity community model, I work directly with people who are in the crisis of poverty. I do a conference for them. And I start out by saying, anybody here got attitude? And I get a whole lot of, hell yeah, or you damn right. And I say, good, good. Because you watch your mom do without food and attitude is an appropriate response. If you're watching grandma do without her medicine, that smart mouth is called for. But how's it work for you when you smart off to your, your caseworker or your food stamp worker, or your unemployment? Oh, so, who, so I, I, I validate it and then I teach people how to use it. Um, but I had that attitude. And so I, I just looked at her, rolled my eyes and she said, why don't you take the number? It might be helpful. And she even got a little aggressive about putting the phone number in my hand. And I walked out of there thinking she doesn't know anything. And I got in my car and I'm driving illegally home. And I drove illegally for 14 years. But we passed law saying, don't drive unless you have car insurance. Well, where's car insurance on the priority list when you're making choices between rent and food? If we're going to pass legislation, we have to talk about how that's going to happen for our most vulnerable populations. So I would love to have insurance. It's no fun to be illegal. Uh, and United States, we're a driving society. We don't have transportation systems, even in our big metro cities, that will actually get a single parent somewhere they need to be when they need to be there. And we need to be honest about that too. There are places like London and Paris where you really don't need a car. We can't say that in the United States. Uh, we're, even Portland, Oregon, we're so famous. We have the tram, the trolley, the max train system. No, try to be a single parent and get to the different places you're trying to get to to get crisis needs met. You're going to be late. So that kind of dialogue has to happen in communities as well. So I'm driving illegally home. I see the Pizza Hut and I thought, well, I could get a job back there. I worked there, but we still got evicted. We still went hungry. Only thing Pizza Hut did was take me away from my family. And they were in crisis and they needed me. So I thought, well, I have this number. So I called the number and the woman on the other end of the phone, this pilot welfare to work program said, why don't you come and see if it's a good fit? So I showed up and two different perspectives, her perspective, her pilot program she's been working on for two years is about to start and she's excited. And so she's like, we're happy to see you. Now we've worked really hard to put together a program for you. Um, one of the first things you're going to be doing is Myers-Briggs. And I think at this point she saw my nonverbals going like, you alien. And she, and I was like, she stopped. She said, oh, Donna, Myers-Briggs, that's, that's kind of like a personality test. And you're going to explore like what kind of jobs you might like to get. Well, now let's look at it from my perspective. 26 years of living in destitution. 
I am about to be on the streets. I got a 72 hour notice to move. I know if I get on the streets, my six year old, two year old and 15 year old cousin will be taken away. And so I, I'm not even hearing her. I mean, at this point, I'm just, it's like Charlie Brown movie, wah, 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 wah. And I'm thinking, I got to get out of here. This is not going to help. This is, I got to find a place for my babies to lay their heads so they don't take them away from me. It, then she said, if you complete our program, you're going to become eligible for Section 8 housing. And through the fog, I was like, what? You got my attention. What do you want me to do? I'll do anything. You want me to jump a hoop? I'll jump. You want me to tell you something? I've been trained to tell people whatever they want to hear because that's the only way they'll help. And then she said, we're going to help you change. And I was like, I have to be okay. I am all my kids have. I have to be okay. So I dig in my heels and you're not changing me. Actually, at that point, I said, you ain't changing me. And I'm thinking, I'll do whatever you want me to do to get that housing voucher. And I'm going to get it. And then I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go find me a man to take care of me. That's where I was at 26 with no hope and no belief that I had anything to offer. So if that director had listened first, if she had said to me, help me understand, you know, what's in your way? What would you like to happen? What difference would that conversation have been? Would she have started with Myers-Briggs? Yeah, but you don't know what you don't know. And it's like, I mean, I'm pretty smart and I have a lot of um, race awareness now. And when I heard the interview and when I read things on you, I mean, I kept, my mouth kept dropping open because it's not anything I would ever have come in contact with. Yeah. And again, that's, that's what I learned. It wasn't that people don't care. And that is our hope. That is our hope. It is not that people don't care. That We don't have a shortage of caring. What no, we no. have is a shortage of foundational knowledge and understanding of this thing called poverty. And we are about to be hit. I just uh, saw this morning, uh, Italy is warning the world. Um, after the pandemic comes more poverty. So what, are we ready for it? Let's mobilize our, our communities. Let's have a strategic post-pandemic plan. We're helping organizations to do that. Tomorrow, I will be working with leaders in Georgia uh, to, to do that very thing, uh, to align us in our communities, to take an if not me, then who approach. Because you have, with the scarcity model, you have also the eligibility model so that's what we've used for 40 years to fight poverty is the eligibility model, even though we have almost that many years of research saying the eligibility model doesn't work because it makes people forget there's a human right in front of them. It's like, oh, you don't fit in my box? Sorry. But no, just, we got just resources. We've got the resources. Yes, we've got we the people. We've got the willingness. It's just utilizing it, putting it together. And Cuomo is the only one that I've seen so far who's even thinking that way. Yeah. yeah. And, Do you have the will? Do you have the will? So when it affects me, like, you know, when, when COVID-19 happened, we saw clearly that what happens to people in poverty is happening. It's going to happen to us. You can only have so many gated communities. Yeah. Um, we are intertwined. What happens to you affects me. And understanding that increases our will. Uh, and, and what happens when you gain poverty competencies and you become poverty informed is you are able to separate the people from the poverty. And, yeah. and once you can do that, you stand in awe of the people who are living in the war zone of poverty. I have studied the history of poverty, United States of America. I've done a content analysis of the literature and you will find in that literature, the most common metaphor used is war. And, and that if humans don't have their fundamental needs met, what mode are they in? Yeah. So you have children who lose their childhoods yeah. because they're, they're at two years old. They're, they're trying to help the family who are all in crisis. Uh, you have, I mean, when I tell people I dropped out of school at 15 and got married, so many middle-class folks will say, oh, you were a baby. And I'm like, baby? Yeah. No, you live in the war zone of poverty 15 years. You're not a baby. 
We don't get the luxury to have a childhood. If you, if you say to a middle-class kid, how much is your electric bill? What do you think they would tell you? I mean, I wouldn't have known. Yeah. If you say to a kid in the crisis of poverty, how much your electric bill? They will tell you how much theirs is, how much grandma's is, <laughs> and who's mm -hmm. got theirs shut off. And people will say, well, my parents protected me from poverty. That is situational poverty. Yes. And you can't, if you're constantly evicted, my only experience with police officers is they took away everybody I love. And, and if they weren't there to take somebody away, they were putting eviction notices on our door, kicking us out of our home. So that is my only experience with police officers up until I'm 28. So what's my perception of police officers? I mean, I used to tell my kids, you better listen to me. I'll call the cops on you. I'll get cops. Come and get them. <laughs> so when I, my second marriage, my husband comes from a plumbing family, um, but they own the plumbing company, totally different social class. I tell people he grew up national geographic. I grew up national Enquirer. <laughs> I have to teach him things all the time, but he, he has this completely different paradigm about police officers. So when we had children together and I said something like, you better get in your car seat, or I'll call the cops on you. He's like, oh, horrified. Don't make him afraid of the police. Yeah. And I'm like, huh? What? Now I'm at a party shortly after that in a, in a neighborhood, half million dollar homes. And it's the 4th of July. Everybody's out. They set up tents. I live in Portland, Oregon. So we're minutes from Washington State. Someone had gone into Washington State, purchased fireworks. The kids are all excited. And they, and, but Washington State fireworks are illegal in Oregon. So I'm kind of watching this scene and a police officer pulls up on a motorcycle. Now, my frame of reference, who's going to jail? Who's getting slammed on the ground, handcuffed, taken away? I watch the officer. He walks over to where the adults are barbecuing. There's some conversation. He picks up a plate. He makes a hot dog. Yeah. I'm stunned. I'm, I'm, my first thought was, well, while he's eating the hot dog, maybe the kids will have time to hide those illegal fireworks. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is my experience. And, and you compare that with, I, live in a, I lived in high poverty communities 45 years. My windows smashed out. My, my, my car hit and run. I couldn't get an officer. I got a form to fill out. Uh, so perceptions even of the helping professionals. That's why it's equally important in communities to educate people who are in poverty. And one of the things I teach in the opportunity community model in the morning activities, it's all around me, remove the shame, rebuild the hope. And one of the concepts I teach is it's not that people don't care. It's that they don't know. And so I help make it part of their jobs to help people understand what their worlds look and feel like. And it, it generally takes me about 90 minutes to change body posture away from that shrunken, beaten down. Many people in the crisis of poverty can't even look you in the eye. They're so beaten down by that evil villain poverty. So I, I teach them real causes of poverty, just like I teach the professionals. I use different examples. I use different language. Uh, part of the way I was able to make it through community college as I got to community college at 26 and I entered a world of words I'd never heard before, subject matter I'd never been exposed to. And I, I, I would go ask the instructors or professors, what does this word mean? And they would send me to read books. And I didn't know what those words meant. I didn't understand the examples. But my brother had spent his 12 years in prison reading. And so I would write him letters. Uh, Wayne, I got a test in three weeks in history. Find out everything you can. Here's what they want me to know. And he would do research in prison, and then he would write me letters from prison. And, and they were often more than 20 pages. Mm -hmm. And he would say, Don, I remember when we were picking fruit, and we were living in that berry camp, and we were doing this. That's kind of what they're talking about now uh, in this example. And he would use familiar vocabulary. I used to say familiar. He would use examples from our childhood. And that's, you know, my doctorate is educational leadership and learning theory says a human can't grab information if you don't make it relevant to their lived experiences. So you see a lot of helping professionals using examples that, that people have no reference for. In my research with parents in the crisis of poverty, 92% reported that when they walk away from a helping professional, 
they don't know what to do next. I mean, so often you, you give someone a form or you tell them something and they walk away going, where do I go? Who, what'd she say? We're not communicating. And, and sometimes it's because of the vocabulary. Sometimes it's because of the examples. And sometimes it's because of the styles. Tomorrow I'll be doing, oh no, it's not tomorrow, sorry, June 4th. I will be doing a, a 90 minute workshop on communicating and relating more effectively across poverty barriers. And people can register for that on the website and we'll get into some of the intricacies of differences in communication style and how we can communicate in ways that build relationships that matter, how we can use familiar vocabulary so that people do are able to walk away and better understand um, and, and really set people up for success. Uh, so that they are taking those steps that they need to do and we need to do to help them on their path out of poverty, which has got to be our goal. No poverty. This has been amazing. This whole, the researching and then the joy of being able to hear you right oh, here you. Um, has just changed my life. Thank you. And made me aware. And it, it was painful watching your PBS special face to face, which everyone should watch, was very painful. But it made me understand things that I, not because I'm a bad person, because I'm really a heart person. Mm -hmm. I just had no idea. No yeah. idea whatsoever. And, and, so, and you can't know. You know, I often have people after my keynotes or workshops, they'll come up and they'll say, I've done that to people. I've said those things about people. I've treated people that way. And I say, how could you not? Sure. We graduate people from college. I mean, I go into school of social work programs. And I look for poverty in the curriculum. It's not there. What you find is drug abuse, child abuse, mental health, child abuse, sex abuse. Where's affordable housing, living wage jobs, access to nutrition, access to preventative care? You know, if you look at addiction in the United States, people will say, well, they're poor because they're drug addicts. So how many people have ever heard of somebody who's wealthy that struggles with addiction? A addiction lot. It's a mental health issue. Um, and it, it, um, I mean, sorry, it's a medical issue. Uh, our courtrooms are full of people with medical issues. <laughs> And we, we don't send them to the hospital, we send them to the court. And I watch these judges, I train judges, and I watch these judges hands tied. Like, what do you do with this person who clearly needs medical attention, but they're in a courtroom? So that has to change. Um, you have a crisis with mental health. Um, how does America address mental health issues? We don't. We don't. But the reason we have so much mental health is, is we have the most unhealthy culture. The way we treat one another, not just in poverty or race, I mean, just as human beings. And the way we try to compress people and make them into something that they're not. True. That's it's, very true. You know, I, I will ask, communities will tell me, Dr. Beagle, you got to help us. You know, our, our, our meth is tearing our families apart. Heroin, opiate is destroying our family. Okay, what are we doing about it? Yeah. Uh, jail is number one answer. Yeah, that always helps. So I train drug and alcohol counselors and I say, hey, will jail cure meth? You know what the specialists who've educated on this subject matter will say? They'll say it won't even cure cigarette addiction. Sure. People go to prison for seven years, they get out, they smoke because the addiction is never treated. And people who can access Shantax or Nicorette, their smoking rates are down. People who can't, their smoking rates are up. And you, people get mad at people for smoking. Well, we know it suppresses appetite. It calms nerves. Yeah. I absolutely hate cigarettes. They killed my dad. I, I told three people in poverty, I'll help you quit. I will pay for the Nicorette program. I wasn't even to stage three. I'd spent over $500. Yeah. So some communities will say, well, we have a five-day rehab program if those people on meth really want help. Oh. Most I see nationwide is 30 days. Yeah. So the literature says it takes a year of intense rehab to be free of those harder drugs. But the so, other piece, you need to change the environment. I, I have a master's in counseling and I did um, rehabs. If you don't change the environment and change the other things, it's like the, what we need to do in this country to me is so huge. And I, I mean, I'm glad we have people like you to do that section and we have somebody else to do this section and that thing. But there's just so much as a human culture 
-hmm. that we need to address. It's just wrong. So thank you so much, Dr. Donna Beagle from Communications Across Barriers. And I just want to um, say the names of her books again. First book is Be the Difference, an action approach to educating students in poverty. Then The Class Continuum, an exploration of class in America. Then If Not Me, Then Who, Empowering Our Neighbors. And you can also find out more about her institutes and everything else that's going on at uh, Communications Across Barriers at www.combarriers.com. So this is Diane Shaver, your host on Transformations Podcast, interviewing people changing our world. And I'm hoping one day I'll be interviewing you when you step up and do something that touches you deeply. So you can find our previous interviews in all of our um, social media, including Buzzsprout, um, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, everything. And you can find all of our links at www.transformationspodcast.com. So I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.